Thanks very much. We have a slightly truncated uh, EAD seminar today because of the, the Alumni Council meeting, so we'll, we'll get right going. Uh, I'm Aaron Hollander. I'm the program coordinator of the Craft Teaching Program. Uh, a very warm welcome to our guest in the Alumni Council and the Baptist Theological Union. It's a pleasure, as always, uh, to have you here for the Spring Dean Seminar um, with our alum of the year, John Corrigan. For those of you who haven't been um, before to a Craft of Teaching session, the Craft of Teaching is Divinity School's uh, pioneering and, and cutting edge program in pedagogical development for our graduate students. The Dean Seminars are our uh, flagship program where we invite distinguished alumni in a range of fields and institutions uh, to bring their insights back to Swift Hall and lead a seminar on some sort of problem or challenge in pedagogy that animates them and the teaching that they're doing at their institution. Uh, the, the general themes of the Dean Seminars are uh, institutional context, reflecting the past teaching commitment that all teaching is inherently local. Um, functioning within a particular context with particular students. Um, course design is a central theme, and we've, we've asked Dr. Corgan to, uh, to share one of his syllabi with us. And leadership in higher education, uh, with the understanding that all of our, uh, our distinct alumni are in some way um, leaders, both for their communities and as models for their students. So a very warm welcome to you all. If you're a student and you want faculty teaching credit, which I very much hope you do, please sign in. Um, lunches look like everyone's settled. There's coffee. Feel free to get it at any time. And um, only very quick announcement: uh, we have a, a rich remaining schedule of craft teaching programs, um, events on teaching online and incorporating uh, digital uh, technologies into the classroom, events on uh, charitable reading and building um, students' comments into something more productive. Um, and on um, what's our last one? On starting a career, a teaching career in constructive studies in particular, the first of several events um, over the course of the next couple of years, reflecting the various traditions of Swift Hall uh, in its in its disciplinary process. Um, I also want to call your attention again to the Craft and Teaching blog, which over the last couple of years has uh, invited early career alumni to participate in a conversation connecting the programming. Uh, on site here in Swift Hall with their own teaching, their own challenges. This uh, this quarter, as we did very successfully last year, our cohort of alumni bloggers are engaging with Professor Corrigan's work um, in religion and emotion and extending uh, some of his analyses into the realms of their own pedagogy. So I encourage you to take a look at the Craft Teaching blog. It is Craft of Teaching Religion. Uh, dot wordpress.com. Only one of those reflections is up so far, but we have another one going up next week and throughout the throughout the quarter. So I'll hand things over to Dean Rosenberg to introduce our guest, and then I suspect we may would like maybe would like people to go around and introduce themselves. Why don't we go around and then let's do that. Let's okay. introduce ourselves and finish up the here to introduce our guest. Absolutely. I'm Rick Rosengarten, and I think I'm the only person in the room who knows everyone in it, which is why it's great to be Dean, but I'm not going to take a lot more time because I want to get our guest of honor talking to you and doing a conversation with him. Um, I'll have a chance to introduce John and Greg on this afternoon. Um, I do want to draw a quick analogy, which I'll develop more later, which is an inducement I know to all of you, since you love hearing me speak metaphorically, to come to his lecture. Um, uh, you may know if you follow sports these days that there's been a lot of talk about triple doubles in basketball. And Russell Westbrook recently just finished a season in which he averaged a triple double. And he's only the second player in the history to do that after Oscar Robertson. Um, in the academy, we have triples too, teaching, research, and service. And I think it would be fair to say that most faculty members, and I would include myself in this, do not excel at all three but they do one or two of them well and are allowed to get by as a result. Uh, our guest today is someone who is the Russell Westbrook of the um, He is an exceptional scholar, a uh, superb teacher, and a man who knows how to build departments and work with state-funded universities to promote the study of religion. Uh, that's a pretty mean combination in my opinion. Um, I will also say that he knows how to build fireplaces, and he has union affiliations. Some of the students should know that. And uh, is just a wonderful person. Uh, John was finishing his PhD when I came here, and he is 
and unfailingly generous and funny and a friendly guy. And I couldn't be more pleased to welcome him back to Sir Paul. Welcome back. Oh, okay. Thanks very much. Uh, Joe, I don't know if I'm going to be able to uh, pull you out of the fire on this one, but I'll give it a shot. Uh, it's a great honor to be here. I'm really looking forward to having this uh, discussion with you today. Can you hear me okay? Uh, and uh, I think the best place to start is to begin to tell you something about uh, my own interest in teaching and maybe something about the people that I teach. The, uh, the oddity of this event, in some ways, is that I've never written about pedagogy. Um, I don't think I've ever given a seminar on pedagogy before. Um, I don't think if you were to um, quickly survey my profile that is represented in my vita, you would think of me as somebody who has made a, uh, a kind of um, central part of his career. But, I could say that uh, I've had a great many conversations about teaching, and teaching graduate students um, in a certain sort of way is always a prompt to keeping you on your, keeping you on your toes about teaching and helping you figure out what the better way to do it is. Because, particularly where I teach now, we operate in a kind of, uh, I don't know, kind of an assistantship slash apprenticeship system. Uh, through which graduate students by degrees are led through different parts of the teaching life and given a way to understand it, some tools to work with, some experience, so that eventually by the time they get a little bit further along in their programs, they can teach their own class. Um, my ideas about teaching in part are informed by the conversations I've had with a lot of graduate students those conversations tend to remind me about the things that were always difficult for me to put together when I first began teaching. Uh, but also, of course, there's my own experience of teaching over a lot of years in different institutions, and I have uh, you know, some um, fairly uh, systematic ways of thinking about what makes good teaching and what doesn't make such good teaching. So let's we'll see if uh, maybe some of my thoughts on this will be useful for you today. Uh, I'll begin by saying something about the students that I teach. So I teach at Florida State University, which is a large state institution. There's 42,000 students. Uh, the students uh, are the students I have in this course that I passed out the syllabus for. If you managed to see it online or see it now, uh, are basically first-year students. This is an honor section, which means uh, these are students who are a little bit higher achievers than the other students in the class uh, that they entered with, the freshman class. Uh, but for the most part, they're a good, uh, good example of the kind of students we have and the kind of expectations that all of us have when we teach first year students. Uh, the university, uh, the recent um, entering class of freshmen at the university, like the ones of the last 15 years since I've been there is a strong class. Uh, they average around 1,300 on their SATs, and they arrive with 4.1s, I think the president told us last week, GPAs. Um, so they're, they're pretty strong as a class generally, but these are students who are just a little bit above that. I just mentioned that to give you an idea of how I pitch this and what I can expect of the students with those kinds of capabilities. Okay, so uh, I love to teach first-year students. Um, there were a lot of years that uh, I didn't teach anything but graduate students. I was chair of my department for six years, and I was chair at another university for a while. And uh, because of the reduced teaching load that came with that, and also because um, what was actually needed by the department, for a long time I taught only graduate students. But I began my teaching career. When I finished my dissertation, I started at the University of Virginia as an assistant professor, and uh, I began my teaching career teaching gigantic lecture <coughs> sessions in these big rack back auditoriums that would fill up with uh, 300 or 350 students. And I think in part that um, framed uh, one of my approaches, at least the way in which I construct a persona in front of the class in order to get across the kind of things I think I need to get across. So uh, my first experiences in teaching really were experiences in which I had to be a little bit bigger than life, 
and jump around a little bit more, wave my arms a little bit more, repeat things a little bit more, uh, modulate my voice in a much more um, practiced way than I think was my uh, inclination. But um, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I liked it partly because when you get first year students, even if you get them in a big, a big uh, kind of setting like that, you get kids who most of them were among the smartest kids in their high school. They haven't been beaten down by the system yet. They all have wonderful questions. They all believe that they have something to contribute. And the, the trick of a, a large class like that is more a matter of trying to rein in the discussion rather than problem. Um, the courses I'm teaching lately tend to be much smaller. The first year honors classes tend to be 18 or 19 students, something like that. And so what we're going to talk about today, building off of the syllabus, has to do with those smaller classes and how you construct those a little bit differently than larger classes. Um, there's different kinds of goals, I think, for uh, introductory level courses. I teach courses mostly in American religious history, but I teach a lot of method and theory courses as well. And I teach occasionally courses in European religious history. Uh, but um, in thinking about what I want out of the course, it, it always seems to me to come back to um, several interrelated goals that I have. Um, one is I want students, of course, to learn something about the subject matter. But I also want them to be able to learn to read critically. I'm talking now about first year students, entering students. I want to teach them how to read critically as much as possible. And I want to teach them how to write about what they read. But I want to do all of that, again, within the framework of a set of themes or a set of topics that I assemble for them uh, as the matrix of the course. Everything has to be within the context of what we're talking about when we meet in class uh, two days a week or three days a week. So reading, writing, and talking about the lecture material all for me ought to be interconnected in some way so that each reinforces the other and each advances the other. Um, but I guess the, the, the key to all of this is, is typically in um, undergraduate courses is the writing. Um, writing forms the, the centerpiece around which a lot of the rest of this stuff orbit. Even my lectures, which are chock full of information and perspective and sometimes attitude, um, are second in some sort of ways, although intertwined, second to the writing. The writing is what really matters, right? And um, the writing is, uh, you know, it's not, it's not like pulling teeth to get students to write as it was when I started teaching in the early 1980s. Uh, students arrive now, at least at the institutions I've been at recently, uh, pretty well prepared to write. Um, surprisingly so sometimes. Uh, this last course I taught, you were looking at the syllabus. Last fall, out of 18 students, uh, the three best writers in the class were all physics majors. Right? Uh, I'm not quite sure how to add that up, other than to say I was a scientist when I started uh, as an undergraduate. So maybe there is a connection. I've also heard a rumor, it might be true or not, that the math part of the SAT is a better predictor of your capability to succeed as a writer than it is a capability to succeed as someone who wants to move on to a more complicated math. Uh, that being as it may, um, writing uh, is something that they're a little more comfortable with than perhaps students were 20 or 25 years ago. But writing is still a challenge. And writing is a challenge in part because um, for them, there's a kind of a mysterious element to it. Right? Any fact, really, is a mysterious element for me <laughs> into writing, and probably for everybody in this room who's ever sat down and written. Uh, when I sit down and write a book, I always kind of wonder, how am I going to write about this? You know, What kind of voice am I going to take? What kind of data do I really need? Who's my audience? Right? Uh, how do I want to write long paragraphs with long sentences or short paragraphs with short sentences? You know, and what's the voice? Right? Do I want to be a canonical wizard? Do I want to have some kind of sensibility that suggests I'm part of what I write? Um, how exactly do you puzzle all of that out in such a way as to get across what you're passionate about in the subject matter, but at the same time um, make it uh, possible for people who are unlike you to read the book or the article, whatever it is, and make sense? 
Um, so uh, they might be good writers, um, you know, based on their bubble test scores and some other sorts of things. But um, they still, I think, approach writing as something that's a little bit daunting, just as I do, and just as uh, my graduate students writing dissertations remind me all the time, just as they do. Right? Uh, anybody who's ever supervised a master's thesis or a dissertation knows that they can go through a lot. They can go through a lot of drafts, or at least parts of them can go through a lot of drafts as people figure out exactly what it is they're supposed to do. So. Um, writing is very important, and um, I want to teach them something about tone and approach and precision, how to remain open-ended but still be able to say something, all those kinds of things, what data to use. Um, and to talk about it as something that is mysterious, and it's going to always remain a little bit mysterious. Right? I don't want to disabuse them of the notion that there's something wonderful about writing in the sense of being wondrous, uh, but I also want to give them a sense that it's manageable, that it's a systematic approach you can take, there's things you can do to help with writing. So my approach uh, to try trying to demystify some of the work, while at the same time leaving them empowered enough to experience it wondrously, is to focus on two things. I focus basically as I'm assembling the course and figuring out how I want to, how I want to put all this stuff together. I focus on voice and form. And by form, I mean basically rules. Right? I want them to understand that there are such things as rules of writing. Right? And um, none of this is uh, you know, rocket surgery. All of it is pretty straightforward. And I, I, I set it up that way on purpose. Right? I want to give them a sense that there's something mysterious and wondrous about writing, but also something simple about it. And the way to get across that idea that something is simple is to just make up a list of 20 rules that I expect them to follow when they write, right? And it's in some ways, I think, possible for me in doing so to create um, a, a kind of um, comfortable space for them to think about their writing within, right? I think um, rules can be liberating as much as they can be constricting. And I want them to feel that once you embrace a certain, a certain form, once you understand some of the rules of writing, even as as simple as how you put a comma between two consonants, you know, uh, that um, if you understand something about the rules, then you're able to move forward. So um, I play a little sleight of hand with them, to be honest, you know, so there's some trickery involved in all of this to say that learn these 20 rules and you'll be able to write, right? I think partly that's true, but partly also it's a way of getting into their head in such a way as to be able to get them to think about how they can learn these rules, they can follow them, and then they'll be free to do other sorts of things. So I include this at the end of the syllabus, my 20 rules, which are things like, uh, well, we can just look at a couple of them real quickly. You know, things like put a title on, on, on the top of your essay, don't split your infinitive, don't use passive, um, don't, uh, don't have um, dangling prepositions, all that sort of thing. Get rid of all the weasel words like, uh, you know, uh, it seems to me that, or I feel that, or sometimes I think that, or all that kind of stuff. Say it directly, have a strong voice, all of that. Use strong verbs, probably the biggest thing I talk about is go over your um, essay before you turn it in and on every page change at least one verb possibly two verbs, to be able to use stronger verbs and get rid of some of the prepositional constructions that ordinarily you need with a weak verb. Uh, but make it, you know, make it look good, uh, make sure that uh, you use punctuation correctly, all that sort of thing. I go over these carefully with them, but I go over them once, the very beginning of class, and then it's up to them, right? When the papers come in, any, any mistakes that are made in violation of these 20 points immediately lead to points up. Right? You miss three or four of these, basically you've taken an A paper down to a C already, right? And it gets harder as the term goes up. So I use this kind of emphasis upon form partly as a way of reinforcing for them some of the things that they should have known already when they come into class, but also I say as a way of reorienting them to their writing so that they feel more confident about what they can do. The second thing is about voice, and I stress voice um, because as everyone who's ever taught first year students knows, one of the most common questions two days before the first paper is due is, do you want our own thoughts, right? And uh, there's a fine line between getting their own thoughts and um, getting their own thoughts about the material. Uh, so, so the, uh, 
But the trick is to get them to believe that I want to know their thoughts, but of course, at the same time, help them understand that I want them to think critically about what's going on and digest it and give it to me. Right? So the, the idea here is that they need to have a strong, clear voice about what they're writing, and they need to uh, do it in such a way that they uh, you know, can embody some of their own mm -hmm. perspective and some of their own firm attitude about whatever it is that they're trying to explain. But at the same time, uh, they have to do it so that it's not just uh, a kind of a run-on impressionistic sort of thing. Everybody gets this. Uh, I call it boys. Other people have other ways to describe this. But I think it's crucially important for them to appreciate how necessary <coughs> this is. And some of them, you know, everybody in Canada, you talk to first-year students, will recognize this. Um, sometimes they're very shocked. And they, they, sometimes they can be very smart about what they've read. They talk great in class when you call on them. They're very critical. They're engaged all of that, but they just don't have a shyness about putting it in writing. You know, there's a hurdle there about being able to say, instead of, instead of saying something like, well, I feel like the primary character in this book is difficult to that or whatever it is, just say, I didn't believe character. Right? Or I didn't believe this claim to be author, or whatever it is. To get them to say that, I think, is really important. It requires some prompting. So what I want to do is um, I want to talk to them about, um, about form, about the rules and how the rules are a refuge for them and a, a point of safety as well as uh, something that may, maybe can liberate them but at the same time talk about what voice is a really important trick that they have to learn as they move on to writing. Now, uh, the, uh, the voice, of course, has something to do with subject matter. The subject matter has a lot to do with the way I teach it. So none of this reading of books or writing um, really uh, can be talked about in absent of absentia. We're in Kenny's left, we're in the yes. right? yeah. in the in the absence of uh, the material of the course. So um, I always uh, make sure that I set them up to be able to think in a number of different ways about the material when they read it. So typically what I'll do is I'll have um, a course like this with uh, four or five books that they have to read, all of which will be really closely linked to the lectures in the class discussion, right? Um, so right away, I'm going to try and build uh, an intellectual framework for them to engage the writing. And my, my first goal in the course really isn't giving them a kind of survey knowledge of religion in America. It's giving them an opportunity to drill four or five deep wells into American religious <coughs> history and learn something about it from that, right, from those kind of very focused topics that I use in my syllabus. But I choose books that are a different genres, so I always include a novel in this particular incarnation of this course. It was The Rise of David Levinsky. I always have a kind of textbook type book. This was this uh, documentary history of intolerance in America that uh, myself and Lynn Neal wrote. Um, I include uh, a kind of focused monograph so I have a monograph on, uh, some of you might know, on Walmart and American religion. And uh, then I include a kind of larger, chronologically expansive monographic writing. This was on uh, religion and race and stuff. A brand new, great book, just out of the press house for the University of Chicago Press. Uh, but you can look at it in the paper, uh, in the syllabus. Um, so sometimes I also include, uh, depending on what term it is, and sometimes are longer than others, I can include um, uh, the uh, reduction of the Indies, or the destruction of the Indies, you know, by a book by uh, Las Casas about the uh, so-called uh, Black Wedge of Spanish and Caribbean in uh, New Spain in the 16th and 17th century. It's a uh, kind of hair curling, some of the people here I'm sure have read it, kind of hair curling, very disturbing uh, set of um, observations that he makes about the way in which the Spanish oppressed the Indies. But it's a good source book. It's a great source book because he's so over the top. And uh, if anybody's ever seen this before, he's so over the top in describing what the Spanish do uh, that we have to back up a little bit because everyone's immediately sympathetic to the harsh treatment given the, the Americans by the Spanish. But we also have to figure out about how there's a there's an agenda to this book that has to be smoked out in order to understand how it's a source. Uh, piece of source writing that uh, can't be read naively. It has to be read critical sort of So sometimes include that well. So different kinds of genres, I guess, is the simple thing, right? 
that I'd like them to come to terms with. So uh, we, uh, we look at different sorts of genres, and then um, we, we always um, spend about two weeks talking about the parts of American religious history that have something to do with whatever that book is about. So if we're writing about um, this great book about Walmart, uh, I spent two weeks, sometimes a little bit more, just talking about what's the relation between economic ideologies, capitalism, uh, liberalism, and religion in America. Give some historical examples of that. Uh, raise critical questions all the time about what do we see when we look at something like, in this particular case, Walmart or any number of other sorts of things, uh, Washington, D.C., uh, the local uh, town hall, whatever it might be. Um, but to try to give lots of uh, historically framed examples of what all these things have to do with each other. Then we go on and talk about the other stuff, whatever it might be. I spend a lot of time talking about immigration, particularly about Jewish immigration to American consequences of that for uh, intolerance of Jews, but also for particular paths that uh, Jewish religious groups take as they develop in America. Um, all of this, we can talk about this as uh, in a conversation now in a few moments. Um, but I always try and uh, frame the reading as much as possible so that um, they have some place to stand as they read. And I don't want them to just jump in and uh, read the rise of David Levinsky without understanding a whole lot about Jewish immigration. And I, I learned this by degrees over the years. When I first started teaching this book, a long, long time ago, in the early 1980s at the University of Virginia, what I discovered was if I didn't give enough background, I'd basically get a lot of reviews that talked about the romantic relationships between the characters in The Rise of Dave Levinsky and why one guy was a no good and why some woman was a no good and why some guy was a saint and some woman was an angel. And it got you know, much more discussion about the things that I cared nothing about in the book in zero discussion about what I really cared about. So and I still have to tell them that, actually. Again, another, like, just as a footnote to what I'm saying, so many students come into class uh, with a writing background that's been forged in literature classes. So they still think writing about a book means uh, starting out by saying, I didn't really like the style. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so in my class, they're not allowed to say that. That's grounds basically for an instant emotion to a B. They can't write about the style at all. But about the, the characters, when you read a novel, there's so much inclined because they've been trained in that way to engage the characters like I can steer them away from that sort of thing. So you need characters in history books and have to steer them away from that. Um, so um, I'm trying to frame all this stuff out as I say, give perspective on the reading. And then we, uh, they write the stuff, they bring it in, we spend a day, sometimes two days, talking about what they wrote. People, like, people are prepared to defend their claims, so everybody has a chance to talk. Um, I have the TAs who I sit down with and we go through what's right and wrong about the papers, give them back to them, and then we start a new cycle. Right? So we've cycled basically four or five books in that way. The upshot of all of this is, for me, it's, it's down to, I wouldn't say it's down to a science at this point, but it's down to a pretty habitual practice for me. Uh, the upshot for me is that uh, I think they learn a lot more about two things. One, writing, but also material. I think they, they get a kind of ownership of material in a way they might not get if I were to just say lecture to them and maybe have a little discussion section every once in a while. Um, they buy in. You know, They have to buy in because I force them to take a stance in their writing and take a strong voice in interpreting the books, they buy in in a way that I think gets them connected with the material in a way that, at least based upon my early teaching experiences a many years ago, I don't think they did. So uh, they learned something more, I think, uh, in a deeper sort of way about the, of course, material American religious history, but I think they also learned something about writing. I think they, the writing improves. I think they do. Uh, experience kind of demystification of their writing to a certain extent, or the writing period to a certain extent, and they um, they develop style. Many of them develop style as well. You know, they, they certainly find their voices, most of them, uh, but they also figure out how they can be a little bit more elegant sometimes. How you know, using a better a better verb always helps. Uh, sometimes using a really simple verb is better than using absquatulate instead of stop, you know. Uh, there can be all kinds of different things that they learn going through this way or that way. 
Uh, anyhow, I'm going on way too much more than I thought I would to start off this discussion. Um, but the last thing I'll say about this is that um, if you looked at my syllabus, one of the things that I've discovered in recent years is it's useful for me to be able to incorporate uh, the clickers into my class. Yes. It's a very simple thing to do, and uh, it's a very useful for me. Um, I, I use it in all, almost all of my classes now. No, almost all of my undergraduate classes. One one thing that's good about them is that uh, you know it's a way to keep track of attendance if you have an attendance uh, marker for part of your grade. Um, it's, uh, it's easy to keep track, but it also makes them come to class. Just makes them come to class. There's no great consequences in my classes if you miss things because of absence. Uh, but I think there's, there's a kind of impulse that develops. I better come and click on my clicker. Uh, but um, I give a quiz oftentimes. I give a one question quiz. Sometimes I'll just stop right in the middle of lecture and I'll have a pre prepared slide that I'll put on the board that has something to do with the lecture and give them a, you know, give them a pop quiz to see if, and it's just one question. I just put it on the slide, they turn on their clickers, they push A, B, C, D, or E, it instantly registers. Goes in there as a permanent, uh, the students say permanent record, goes on a permanent mm -hmm. record in, uh, in my electronic file. And uh, it also um, is a way to teach them about something. Sometimes the questions are a little bit harder, sometimes they're a little bit easier. I also can use clickers. If I get to a point in the course, in, in the lecture that day or the discussion that day, where we want to have a vote, and it might be a vote about something that not everybody wants to raise their hand about, I, I can ask them, what do you think about gaming? This is this is anti man. This is going against the first amendment, that, all that kind of stuff. And uh, I can say, let's have a little, you know, uh, vote about this, right? So you can just quickly turn on your machine, and everybody who thinks yes, push A. Everybody who thinks no, push B. And we look at it. And although there might have been five people talking, all who were yes, the vote might come up, and it might be 15 people no and five people yes. And then we have to deal with it, right? Mm -hmm. And then a lot of times people who were unlikely to talk in class feel a little bit more empowered to uh, you know, bring out their own perspective on it and talk about it in class. That's a useful thing. You know, Again, it's a, it's a trickery of a certain sort of uh, technological sort, but it's useful, I think, um, to sometimes get people engaged in talking about things they might, want, might not want to talk about before. And sometimes it's just useful for me to I can ask questions and, you know, kind of re recalibrate what I'm saying based upon the answers that I give and those kinds of quicker responses. Um, the class learns from it just as I do. So uh, I found that to be useful and that can be incorporated in just about any course. But um, that's an overview of the of my teaching philosophy, which is really to glamorize my thoughts about teaching and call it philosophy. As I say I've never written anything about pedagogy before. Uh, but um, Maybe that's a point of departure for some other discussion you can have now about your experiences and uh, maybe some insights that would be useful for me. Thanks. The floor is open. We're back. We have any discussion. Since I'm scheduled to teach Las Casas in a course on liberation oh, theology yeah. in the fall, and this will be the fourth or fifth time I've used it. Um, do you have an exercise to help them engage it more critically than naively or romantically than I feel sorry for the poor natives? <laughs> well, what I do is I um, I try and tell them uh, something about uh, the way in which Las Casas wanted to make himself more visible as a, uh, an advocate for the Indians and how uh, there's a there's a kind of exaggeration to the story with that in mind. Um, I also say that um, you know all of this stuff, whether it's less analysis or other kinds of source writings from the time, have to be understood as in some ways implicated in the black legend of the Spanish. Um, black legend basically being, I think, in my way of thinking, construct of the Dutch to try to shed a bad a bad light on Spain when they're at war with Spain. So it's trying to talk about, you know, how, how awful the Spanish are when they colonize in the Americas or any place else. Um, and um, that rings, I think, with students. They can't get that there's a larger um, discourse of contestation that's involved 
in um, the writing that must have this that. I don't know if that helps at all. I just wondered if there was something that, uh, you know, a series of questions that you uh, have uh, that that help them to move beyond some of the uh, saturated numbers that appear in the, the, uh, those who've been decimated. Yeah. Well, I refer to others like the contemporaneous writings, Cabeza uh, de Vaca, mm -hmm. I invoke as a his own relation as a counterpart. Mm -hmm. You know, where he talks about um, the Indians in a, you know, in a very different way than mm -hmm. Las Casas does. Try to use those two to push off against the other to try to figure out maybe what's in the middle. Mm -hmm. Do you have any sense of what the imprint is that, that your mode of teaching is on your students? Is there any way of tracking what kind of impact this style of teaching has? for the rest of their career in college? Uh, no, I mean, the, the only notice, the only idea I have about how it affects them is one of the eval scores that I get from students at the end of the term. And um, if I keep in touch with some of them, to talk to them occasionally. But no, there's no systematic assessment of this particular way of approaching it. But are there themes that come up in terms of what they, what they say to you? They're, Appreciative of after these years of being out there? Yeah, yeah, there actually are. They love the themes in the course, actually. Everybody likes them. Uh, partly because when they learned about religion in America in their AP course, in their AP history course, or whatever it was, these topics never came up, mm -hmm. right? People didn't talk about, you know, uh, make a big deal out of race and ethnicity, or, or of economics, or of, um, Emotion is a thing that I write about, or of a, of a certain kind of spatial experience. It's something that I pay attention to in my course, or other kinds of things. They didn't get any of that. It was all about Jonathan Edwards, and then there was, you know, Beecher, and then there was Moody, and then oh yeah, there were some Catholics and Jews in there, and then there was basically Jonestown. Right? That's, their, that's, their, that's what they know. Yeah. So it, it, it uh, forces them to rethink basically everything we know about American religion. Intolerance. Nobody believes there's intolerance. It's, I still don't believe that there's a history of intolerance in America. This is, I still rub my eyes in disbelief. We talk about this early on in the course. Well, don't you know that you know Catholics and Protestants were at war with each other in Philadelphia, with entrenched with rifles and cannons shooting at each other? No. There's an intolerance in, in, in intrinsic to religion. Uh, but there's a long history of religious intolerance and religious violence in America right. that they're unaware of. Yeah. But they figure it out pretty quick, and then they connect the dots very fast. You know, this particular term, I'm actually teaching a, an upper division um, course, uh, undergraduate course in uh, intol religious intolerance in America. And the first, I think it was the first week of class, was uh, the newspapers were filled with all the accounts of the Jewish cemeteries that were desecrated and all that kind of stuff that happened when Trump took office. Um, so suddenly the light went on for them that maybe this didn't fall out of thin air, that there was a tradition of this, that they need to be engaged. Yes? Um, I'm thankful for, for your insights. Um, I was wondering how you... Um, if you have any insights, or how do you deal with uh, the different levels of background knowledge that students bring to the classroom? And in the course, you want to be, you know, as general as possible. Of course, you listen to the report, but from your shows, I, 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 you focus on five books, who themselves have not read any of them, but, but they are secondary li literature, so there must be some background that the student, that the student needs to understand some of this reading. So, you so find that we are just one reading to your lectures, concentrate on that background knowledge, and then they understand better what they read. Or, uh, I mean, I'm trying to deal with my own head out of, with a sink or swim. You know? <laughs> You're thrown into this ocean of information, but religion in the U.S. is a huge field in which I might have, I might have zero background. 
So I would read some of your books and then have no background knowledge and understand what's going on. So I would naturally gravitate toward probably outside because I'm not of the subject matter. Yeah. Uh, so how do you, uh, being in the side of the instructor, how do you deal with that maybe lack of information or background knowledge that you just don't have it or personal? Yeah. Uh, so. Yeah. Well, in a certain sort of way, the book is the life buoy in the class, right? That's what I. That's what they can cling to when they uh, start to feel maybe as if there's too much information. But I, I try and be attentive to that. So what I do is I, I am as specific as I can in addressing the, whatever the historical framework is for that book. Uh, you know, I take a few weeks to talk about, you know, what what happens that we religious immigrants when they come to America in the late 19th century. How are Jews a part of that? How is it different from Russian? How is it, you know, all that kind of stuff. I try and build up a, a kind of point of reference for them, in this case by focusing on Jewish immigrants, uh, whereby they can maybe survey a little bit more of the larger field of immigration itself and what it has to do with religion in America, right? Um, but. Um, the, the real centerpiece of that will always be the book, right? And they can always come back to the book and say, well, when we're talking about, say, Polish Americans immigrating to Chicago, um, you know, how is that different? Because in the book, when they show up, da 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 da, it's the same sort of way in Chicago. I mean, they do have a, a book that serves them as a point of reference for asking other questions about the larger framework that I, that I build out for them um, when we're in that part of the course. Is that, does that address your question? Yeah, that, that, I mean, it's not without that kind of answer, I'm pretty sure all, all people here struggle with it. But yeah. yeah. The, the question, maybe the question, one of the questions behind your question is, you know, when is too much information too much information? Yeah. And I, I wonder about that all the time as well. I think that's partly a hit or miss, you know, trial and error operation in the midst of the class, you know, by calculating facial expressions into the, <laughs> the, amount, the amount of silence and uh, the amount of looking out the window, you, you can eventually come to the conclusion that maybe there's information overload and you need to back up a little bit in order in some way. But that's the, that's the art part of teaching, <laughs> which is you know, a really interesting part of teaching. Yes? I, I really appreciate your uh, uh, emphasis on the writing and the writing the little things in the back of the book that uh, I had in my own mind. Um, I, I'm wondering uh, about reading skills. Uh, do you find that students become better readers? Some of it is a lack of uh, students coming from uh, very different backgrounds in terms of uh, levels of knowledge. But I find that reading is a real problem uh, for many students. Uh, starting with just general vocabulary. Uh, I've gone through, uh, take a paragraph, gone through it. It was packed with all sorts of things. And then I realized the students don't know this word, don't know that word. So uh, maybe you're dealing with uh, different students, but do you find that the reading skills advance uh, over, the, over the course of the semester? Is reading a challenge for them? Yeah. Well, I would like to think that reading improves. Um, it's a little bit different in this particular course because I'm throwing four or five different genres at them. Um, and I do that purposely because I want them to figure out that there's different ways of writing reviews and different ways of thinking about books depending on what kind of genre you're engaged in. Um, I can think of other courses I've taught where we read basically, say, historical monographs. And I think they're right there, reading does improve. Uh, because they kind of get in a groove and there's, there's a way to read a historical monograph that you can learn that um, is translatable from one book to another. But I think does improve over the long run your capability to read it and to understand it. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know so much about reading novels, but I think yeah, sticking to one genre in courses where I've taught with just one genre of writing, I think it improves. The reading does improve. My goal in this introductory course is partly to improve their, you know, their, their reading uh, 
on the whole, yeah. but especially to prove a certain part of it, which is reading critically to be able to write about it, which might be different than just having them read along a textbook in the course or something. I, uh, about a year and a half ago, in May or something, I read an essay I had written called Against Textbooks. And uh, my, my gripe with textbooks uh, is that they're really totally artificial in terms of what they construct. And uh, I, I couldn't imagine you using a textbook. I mean, what you have done in your class is you carefully selected some readings. I have a sense that probably your most important preparation for your courses are the books that you decide to select. Because those books are, are actually what the students are encountering. I and mean, that's their experience. And you know, my experience has been that finding that kind of book that is not an academic article of some kind, it's not the kind of thing we publish in general of religion, or history of religion, or so forth. It's kind of a, it's between that and, and, and something that's popular. So, so it's a, a, at this kind of meta level where it's accessible to them, draws them in, but it's not a cookie cutter textbook explanation. And you've done that. I can see that quite by the books that you've selected. And so I, one of the mistakes that I've seen um, young teachers make consistently over the years when they come out is they have students read far too much. And it's usually far too technical of what they're having to read, far too difficult. And the, the, the trick is to find that stuff that is both responsible and hook at the same time, that draws them in. And then you can teach inductively, like you were doing. That is, you use the, the, the book as the springboard into this discussion of the context and so forth. And they do have an anchor and for that. Yeah. One, one thing I was thinking about as I was listening to your presentation um, is that you really have a lot of work to do in, in the way that you teach your course by providing these two weeks of sort of discussion <laughs> that embroider then the selections that you've made. That's a, that's a lot of work. Um, and that's great. I mean, you should be doing that. Another way of doing it is to um, teach more Socratically, in which you draw the students into the dis into the contextual discussion on the basis of what you're having them read. Yeah. yeah, I totally agree. Yeah, I think that can work well also. Um, I think if you're going to do that, however, you have to have them read something that is going to be to a certain extent familiar to them already. Yeah. Obviously, they're going to learn something from the book, but there's got to be some some kind of familiarity already with the book that uh, allows them to get a sense of their own understanding of it, so that, uh, it, which is probably going to change when you talk about it. But then to do exactly as you said, you know, teach out of the book and, yeah. and use that as a uh, point of departure for aggregating the other data. Just another comment. What I really liked about this course from what you told me is that, you know, in, in a sense, you're sinking four or five shafts into American religious history and giving them something. At the same time, you've planted probably four or five bombs in there, too, that explode the sort of stereotypical notions that they bring to the course. I think that's very important yeah. Yeah. to be a bomber. <laughs> yeah, I've always thought that part of my job is to throw them off. Yeah. You know, I mean, you have to, you have to be disruptive, I guess, exactly. to teach effectively. Yeah. Uh, there's a fine line, as you say, you know, you want to disrupt but not be so disruptive yes. that it's kind of productive. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I appreciate it. I appreciate that take on it. So I'm working on the syllabus, and for immigration, for example, you will have three weeks of the topic. And the, the book is The Rise of David Levinsky, which is a pretty good sized novel. So I'm curious how you handle the reading assignment. I've read that. Um, undergrads don't do better when you don't give a, a, a big reading assignment. They're more likely to do it if you give a shorter round. So I'm curious, do you assign the whole book at once and then have different discussions over the three weeks on the book, or do you divide it maybe the thirds? How do you make sure that they've read it all and that you discuss the different angles of the book in your topic? 
Yeah, uh, no, uh, that's an explicit strategy in my part. Uh, uh, as we start each of these, I hate this word, but I haven't found a better one yet, course modules. <laughs> as we start each one, I say that the book for this, as you know from the syllabus, is going to be, in this case, The Rise of David Levinsky. So your papers due this day, we're going to be discussing your papers on these days. Um, it's a long 530 page book. You better start reading it. Right. And um, I leave it at that. You know, I don't come back to it the next day or two days later or whatever and say, what do you think about that third chapter or something like that? I just let them go. Right? And I do that with all of the books, partly because I want them to um, understand that their job is to uh, engage the book in their own way and to follow the leads that they create for themselves at the very beginning of reading that book. Right? I want them to follow what their interest is and to make sense of the book out of what matters to them until they get to the review and then we pull them all apart uh, as, a, as a kind of um, exercise in understanding the book. So you don't, um, you don't discuss the book as you're going through the modules? You let, you let them come up with the ideas at the end and Absolutely. But it's hard for them not to understand something of what they need to be writing about when I'm talking about how difficult it is, you know, to leave the shuttle and come to the Lower East Side. And how, you know, there's a there's a problem with um, getting jobs, there's a problem with language, and there's all kinds of stuff. It's hard for them, you know, when I talk about how people can trade in religious ideologies for social ideologies like social Darwinism. Uh, which is a big theme of the book, of course. It's hard for them to miss seeing that in the book when I've been talking about it in class. But to answer your question really precisely, I, I don't leave it to it at all. I don't talk about the book with them at all until after they've written the video. I wanted to, I guess I have two questions. And the first one is that it seems like the joint technical improvements, um, I think I think this is really helpful for thinking about talking to undergrads about the right, giving up kind of practical examples. These seem to be governed by some principle you talk about boys understanding what you're trying to say, directing your writing towards that. And it seems to me that on the flip side, thinking about reading, you've kind of outlined perhaps a principle for how they could adjust their reading, think about one of these um, kind of frameworks, and use that to organize your questions. Um, as you're reading a text, have you thought about 20 technical improvements to reading? And could you um, suggest maybe three off the top of your head would be helpful for us to so get thinking about teaching in the future? And then the second question is I'm really struck by number 20, what I hire you. How does that function? Are you uh, thinking about students training in college and moving on to the job market and applying skills? Or is this a very meta relationship to the role of the market and the economy? Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, okay, so two basic questions then. Uh, one, yeah, the higher thing, um, I want them to get a clear sense that they have to talk to me like they would talk to somebody who's going to pay them, right? Um, that they have to be just as clear about who they are and about what they think and be as ambitious as they can in getting their ideas across as if I were deciding whether I was going to hire them or not. Okay. Right. And as far as um, tips about reading, <coughs> I actually do talk about that. Um, whenever, if, when we start a new module and I say, this is the book you're going to be reading, right? and then let it go for two or three weeks, um, most of the time I say something about how to read it. So I always say, when we get to, for example, like a historical monograph, I always say, here's how you read a historical monograph. You read the introduction very carefully. <laughs> you go immediately to the conclusion and read the conclusion and make sure it lines up with the introduction. And then you read the chapter conclusions. And then you know basically what the arguments are. Then you go back and you read through each of the chapters to figure out if the data and the, the string of connections that are proffered in each of the chapters make sense. Right? And I have little kind of tips for different sorts of genres 
of how they should read them. But that would be an example that I, I offer to them when they set out to read a, a history book. Like somebody was saying earlier before about textbooks, I personally think it's really important for them to read textbooks. Right? I think, you know, uh, I still read textbooks. Right? I learn a lot still from reading textbooks. And it isn't just that I need to learn a little bit more about the information of some person or place or thing or period or idea or whatever. But learn, you, know, you learn a lot about just the organization of data. You, you know, textbooks organize things in a certain sort of way that are very important for all of us as active scholars. You always need to be engaged in that sort of thing. I think it's important for them to read textbooks. And I think that, um, I mean, I think there's ways to read textbooks that make them more useful than oftentimes students read them. But um, it should always be included. Um, it doesn't have to be a textbook that covers the whole range of the course, but a textbook-like thing. Um, but at least addresses part of the course so they can get used to reading it and understand that it can be decoded in the same way that, say, a historical monograph can be decoded, or even a novel or something like that, decoded in the interest of seeing its relevance to the course. Sure. So one of the things that you said earlier uh, struck me that you mentioned that there's a fine line between uh, getting the students' thoughts and getting the students' thoughts about the material. Um, I thought it was a great line. <laughs> but specifically regarding your emphasis on critical reading and critical writing, uh, especially in disciplines that have a lot of data, uh, and specifically like formal data or mathematical data, uh, for an introductory course, uh, even for an honors first year course, a lot of these students are not prepared in terms of the methodology or, or the nuances of methodology to be able to contradict or critically um, argue with something like statistical data uh, or you know, established historical processes, etc. Um, and a lot of times what I've encountered is that they insert anecdotes from their own experience from small samples or even just personal interactions um, that can be critical of these larger macro generalized perspectives um, but are often objectively wrong. <laughs> how do you how do you navigate the ability for somebody to be critical, especially in the face of something like the emphasis on your data um, and some of these more generalizable um, principles that are working their way to yeah. Uh, well, I think first of all, in the first part of your question, there's such a thing as uh, assigned books that are too ambitious. Right? If I mean, there might be a great book with. When I was actually here at University of Chicago, uh, there was a, a kind of history then that we used to joke was called chart and graph history, right? And it was a kind of social history, but it was, you know, it was historical writing that made really exceptionally deep use of vast amounts of data offered in the course of a monograph as lots of charts and graphs, right? Um, sometimes I don't think students are ready to engage that, right? I don't think, first of all, they understand how the author got that data, right? They don't get that, you know, that stuff isn't just something you look up in an encyclopedia and draw a graph up, right? They don't get the there's a certain kind of historical or uh, scholarly practice that pulls all that stuff out of archives and so forth and assembles it in this understandable or digested form. Um, sometimes it's asking more of them than they're ready to do to present them with that kind of stuff. Even if the conclusions and the arguments are all you know, pretty straightforward, I'm not sure they fully engage what the book is without having maybe even practice some of that themselves, you know. So there's that. Um, sorry, the second part of your question was about I mean, how do you prepare the critically writing about such things? Oh yeah, right. Um, what I was going to respond to is your, your point about what I took to be uh, when you want them to engage, say, the complicated uh, numeracy of an article or a book, and they respond by offering an anecdote, mm -hmm. um, that's a problem, right? Uh, I, I don't exactly know how to solve that, right? 
lots of anecdotes that I get in class oftentimes have to do with identity politics. And oftentimes they can be nicely disruptive of how people are thinking about things. Oftentimes they're entirely isolated from what we're talking about, right? Um, uh, the best scenario always is that somebody offers something about themselves. I think that's what you're suggesting, or some kind of anecdotal evidence um, that uh, makes people think harder about the conclusions that are drawn because of the data. It doesn't help people to understand the data better, but it just might provide them a little bit different of a lens for looking at the data. That's about the best that I could offer with regard to that. But the key is not getting students lost in books full of data that um, don't make sense to them because they don't know where the data came from, how it was obtained, and how it was written. Along a similar line, um, with this question of how we're, what kind of work we're doing with preparing students, I guess I have a question about metaphor, um, ex extending Dr. Holt's comment on, on my bombs in the mine shaft. You, you spoke at the beginning about the hurdles that students are coming into your classes with out of uh, out of high school, hurdles to writing, um, some of them psychological, some of them technical preparation issues. Do you see the work that you're doing? more along the lines of training them to jump those hurdles? Or is it more along the lines of convincing them that they're not really there in the first place? Or is there some sort of balance between those kind of operations? I'm just trying to get clear on, is the is the preparation you're talking about more skill-based, or is it more attitudinal? Skill. Yeah. 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 Uh, it's more skill-based. I think, you know, I can see it with my job in this kind of course probably more than anything else as um, equipping them or helping them refine a set of skills that are going to serve them in other courses and then they move into good citizenship upon graduation. Especially in lieu of your last question, John, would you really talk very concretely about how you think about grading? Um, I mean, do you go into class with the idea that you want to cover the spread of options in the group, do you go in and assume that the way they perform will dictate a set of grades? And if you're willing, how do they sort out at the end? I mean, are they A's and B's and C's? Are they across the gamut? And what's it like giving a grade to someone their first semester in college? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I have one standard for everybody in the class. Right? So uh, everybody's graded basically the same. Um, I'm, I'm pretty uh, intolerant of absences after three or four times and all those kinds of things that affect the grade. But um, I mostly am interested in seeing them improve over the course of the term. And so at the beginning, I grade a little more easily than I do at the end. Right? I, the standards are basically equal for everybody, but the standard changes. You know, there's one standard for everyone, but it bar goes up. In this particular case, and I'm very explicit about that in this course. I say this, the first paper is going to be graded up to this level, but you know, a lot of you're only going to get C's or B's on that, but it's going to be harder next time. And it's going to be harder after that. The last one will be the most difficult. And I do actually give them a final exam, and that's graded on the same standard, right? It has to be, the writing has to be letter perfect, the whole bit, it all has to be, it's a written exam, it all has to be the same sort of thing. There's a very high level, right? So um, when I look at the grades at the end, I tend to weight the grades nearer the end, more than I do at the beginning. And if I see somebody who didn't get their act together until six weeks into the course, but killed it after that. That's a high grade class. Um, as far as distribution, um, a lot of students bail out if they don't think they're going to be able to get an A in the class. Uh, they bail out after, say, three or four weeks. They withdraw. They withdraw. Yeah. Um, they, uh, How dramatic is the numerical change? You go from 20 to 15, or yeah, it's uh, maybe it's uh, the most it ever has been is probably around 20 percent. Mm -hmm. 
more typically between 10 and 15 percent. Uh, so I end up basically with highly motivated people who think they're going to get A's. Ah. Um, <laughs> the uh, distribution is not. <laughs> <laughs> but I give uh, I give a few A's. I give uh, usually you know say a class of say 20. I'll give an A, a plus, one or two A pluses, a few A's, a few A minuses, and then most of the rest are B's. Um, every once in a while, a C. A C is it's almost not a passing grade from what I do. I mean, if somebody just barely eked it out if they got a C. So anything below C is just, we just go straight to it. Is that right? Yeah. No D's? I think I can give it a D in here. So. <laughs> you do that. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 Two questions. The first is, do you have folks who have a negative experience of critical reflection upon their Christian and or Jewish and or basically their own faith being analyzed critically over the course of your career? And the second is, what and how do you deal with that? And the second is, what is it that you believe they're paying you as consumers to do? Uh, overall, are you trying to form character, just critical thinkers, help them get ready for a job? What do they, what do they think they're, or their parents or what? And then how do you see that differently? You know, you know in fact, I'm here to create a good citizen day something and about the gaps between it. Yeah. Um, well, I do have a sense that I'm teaching them something about virtue. And the virtue that I think I'm teaching them is persistence. Mm -hmm. right? I actually make a big deal of this. You know, I have a little sermonette that I give oftentimes at the beginning of a class about the grit test which has its own difficulties, but how service academies and other universities now don't care much about ACTs or SATs, but they care about the grit test, and that there's high correlation between high scores on that and how people do over four years as opposed to the ACT or SAT. But, um, I, and of course, the bottom line for that is just stick to this, right? And so uh, one of the things that I value very highly in that is their persistence in what they do and their insistence upon trying to get it right over time. And, um, I like to reward them for that, but teach them how to do that by coming back again and doing another draft or improving on the next paper and that sort of thing, or just, just phrasing a question better in class discussion. Right? So I think I'm doing that to a certain extent. Um, fairness, I think I'm um, trying to teach them as well. And uh, this gets to your second, your first question, actually, which I'm answering in reverse order. Uh, I try and give them a sense that there are lots of different ways of looking at religion, and that um, there's an uh, insider way and there's an outsider way, but there's all kinds of other sort of in-between ways as well. Right? There are people who are insiders with one, but outsiders to others. There are people who are completely outside, who are just looking at it out of curiosity. There are people who are really hunkered down. Uh, sometimes you see this in the South, uh, coming out of high school in a silo, where they're, it's very difficult for them to kind of move out of that and see other sorts of things. But my emphasis is always that we look, when we're talking about a particular religious group, um, we look at the ways in which sometimes they've been complicit in, say, uh, creating a uh, you know, gospel of wealth, which most students in the class are not too happy about. But other times they're complicit in creating a social gospel. right? Uh, which a lot of students in the class are happy about, right? So um, we do that. Um, I think for their sense of me, uh, according to evaluations, is that I'm unbiased. Um, you know, they, uh, they pick up something in the class that leads them to believe that I'm giving sort of equal voice and equal opportunity to any perspective that comes up in the class, and it's worth people to voice that because it's going to be heard. But in the south, in the southeast, so this we'll might be part curious. of your question. Yeah. yeah, there are people who get very nervous. The one case that stands out in my mind that I had a real difficulty with, I'd be curious how many people would solve this problem, was I had them read uh, a book one time, uh, maybe ten years ago, on the Salem witchcraft trials, which was basically about the way that um, gender was involved in the uh, identification of women as witches, and. Uh, they all, most of them are up good reviews, but except for one student um, who went back and did a very careful 
analysis of Cotton Mather's writings about what was going on at Salem and wrote a fairly long book review in which she drew data from Cotton Mather's theology to push off against the claim that all this witch stuff had something to do with the uh, intolerance of women's uh, empowerments in the last decade of the 17th century in Salem. And for everything that she could pull out of the book, she says, but this is contradicted by Cotton Mather's statement that there really were devils in Salem, and that they took the form of a dog, or that they appeared as these kind of visions, or that they did cause people to feel that their skin was on fire, and so forth. So therefore, and she's talking about this scholar who wrote this book, Cotton Mather is right, and she's wrong. Mm -hmm. right? They went through this whole thing. It was a very orthodox, um, you know, kind of conservative <laughs> reading and understanding of witchcraft. And I, I didn't know what, what to do with her because in, in a certain way, it was pretty good theology for a yeah. student. <laughs> but I, I finally said, I can't, I can't accept this book review because it doesn't address the questions that I've raised in class and you're supposed to be writing about. And the source work is good, but here's a really good course for you to take if you think that this kind of writing is interesting. Here's a course in you know, theology in America, or here's a course in you know, religion and ethics and theology or something. You should be taking this course. Right? Instead of my course, I encourage you to drop out. Right? I said, it's going to be difficult for you to get through this class if you can't figure out what the canons of scholarship are that guide the, the critical reading and writing. Um, you know, I'd be happy to work with you if you want to stay and so forth, but you might be more comfortable in one of these other courses. And so she went. Yeah. What's the relationship of your teaching to your scholarship? Uh, relation of teaching to scholarship. Um, I think I, I take more from my teaching than I expected, um, especially graduate teaching, you know. I, I have learned so much from my graduate students about what my field is. Uh, I've benefited enormously as a scholar from conversations with them. Undergraduate teaching, uh, I think it's forced me sometimes to come off the fence occasionally and make choices about what I think really happened in my interpretation of things. I figure out after a while that I'm not making sense to them when I am a little bit less than direct about what I think. And if I want to, you know, have my own voice. Yeah, I, I feel like you know, sometimes that, that, that did work. I've heard myself say it a few times, that did work. Maybe I can incorporate it into scholarship as well. You know, students prompt you because they want simpler, clearer answers, which rarely can we give. But every once in a while, it's possible to you know, firm up your own perspective because you're trying to help them over a hurdle. Um, Thank you for your for your time. This has been a great conversation, and I'm really grateful for this syllabus. I'm wondering if you're aware when you're teaching pop button issues um, of a gap in perspective between your own location and that of your students. And the reason for asking this is I'm teaching a course in at the social teaching where, where I work, which also engages a number of hot button issues and of the 18 students and their 18 students in the class, I am the white male in the room. And so, I mean, it's, it's a fun class, but I also realize that we're talking about things that I read about and they've lived. And there's this, uh, there's a, a difference in, there's, a difference in privilege or social location that that gives them a very different because my students a very different perspective on this material from what I'm coming at and I don't get neurotic about them thinking that I'm a thinker and that I don't know what I'm talking about but you know between us I don't know what I'm talking about when it comes to it, um, any sort of issues. Yeah. Yes. That's really interesting. I, I always anticipate that in class discussions, there, there are going to be three or four occasions over the course of an hour. Things are going to go in directions I just didn't anticipate at all. And most of the time, I roll with it because I think we're going to get to something that helps us connect all of this better. Lots of times that happens, but as you say, 
lots of times somebody will be talking about something, there'll be five other heads in the class going like this. And I really won't get it. I really want to understand it. You know, how, maybe I don't get it because I'm trying to connect it to the stuff that the course is supposed to be about. But also don't get it, as you say, because there's that difference of perspective over our age differences and our, our situations. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But uh, I do always anticipate that um, that's going to be a part of discussion. And if I can work it in and make it function in a way that's good for everybody, I think it's terrific. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm curious about, you, you talk a lot about writing skills and critical thinking. So how do you relate writing skills with oral skills in the cultivation of critical thinking? And do you weight one more than the other? Or are they, they depend on each other? How does that work? Yeah. Your, your experience might be like mine, but oral communication and written communication can be two really different things. And some students who write exceptionally well have difficulty in class, not necessarily because they're shy or because they're intimidated or something like that. They're just not talkers, you know. Um, I, can, I can always handle the problems with writing, right? I can help them become better writers. But oral communication is really a hard one, right? you know? Because the, the hard part of it is when you teach writing, your comments can remain congruent. Right? Um, you can say you're wrong about this, 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 and this. This is how you get better next time. But in class, it's so hard. There's an sure you know to be able to say, OK, you didn't know what you're talking about when you said that. Right? Here's what we have to go back to. Because it can be too embarrassing, especially for first year students, to appreciate that. So that's always a really big challenge. It's hard. It was hard to even intervene at all in trying to improve their being able to state what they're thinking until halfway through the course when everybody's a little bit more comfortable with each other. Nobody thinks anybody's out to embarrass each other, you know, embarrass the other. Um, it's hard to do. But um, I, I, I basically work out impulse. But I do try and get them to restate things sometimes. You know, mm -hmm. after the course, if somebody says something, I'll say, well, can you restate that maybe using a stronger word? Or can you restate that with direct reference to the book or direct reference to what Susie said or something like that? And oftentimes, they'll stop and think, and they can do it. Mm -hmm. But they have to be prompted to do it and led in that direction. Mm -hmm. Gary, final question. Yeah, um, this and this is great. I probably sell a body part to have these kind of students. Students <laughs> <laughs> from um, my experience in teaching in two other large public universities, but also having a third large university faculty member in my left here. Uh, this is the exact opposite of my experiences, and I'm sort of wondering. And I'm pleasantly surprised, given the fact that Florida has a governor who's actually <laughs> said some very disparaging things about teaching 100, 200 level courses, the humanities, the social sciences, apparently they just just water and college degree yeah, that work out so well. <laughs> <laughs> and so I, I kind of wondered, one, and how this, this, do you find that this is easily readily translatable when you teach non honor students, students that haven't bought in uh, either to their own education or to the value of humanities, even if they're a STEM student, or two, your role as being um, an advocate for the humanities, particularly since the dominant narrative from Bush to Obama administration is the utilitarian value of collegiate education. So that's even part of not the students' narrative of why they're there, but their parents' larger social pressures. Yeah. Um, and how do you handle all those football players? <laughs> yeah, it's, I've taught larger classes, and um, they're never as good. I, I mean, it doesn't, I don't think it even matters what university you're talking about or what field of study it is. I think larger classes are just harder to teach, and they're, they're less productive in terms of learning after the term is over. My, my classes are capped at 40. So 40. Yeah, so I'm not, I'm privileged that I don't have the, <coughs> Stadium seating lecture room. But even then, yeah. 40 students, only 18 will ever show up, and then every day, same 18. Well, the thing about big classes is lots of times, you know, I've taught plenty of big classes where we'll meet twice a week for an hour lecture, and then third meeting will be small discussion groups with teaching assistants, right? Um, which you would think would help a lot. Mm -hmm. But it, it, it helps, but it also is a problem because I can't control the discussion. And when I get back on a, say, like on a, on a 
Monday after there's been a bunch of Friday discussion sections. And it turns out there are eight sections each talking about something completely different. You know, it's challenging for me to try to figure out exactly how I'm going to take my next steps and getting something across. So discussions, small discussion, discussion sections are good, but they have to be they have to be kept in line somehow. You know, and that, that's a lot of work, right? And it's, a, it's asking a lot of graduate assistants, frankly, to take a kind of hearty line about what has to be discussed in all of those classes, right? rather than, you know, encouraging some um, broader kind of discussion based on the interest of a particular group. So that's a problem. And um, as far as the university and its, its uh, advocacy for the humanities, I'm just lucky to be in a place where there's strong advocacy for the humanities, but also lucky to be in a department that um, has such huge enrollment numbers that it can't be denied. You know, we just, we, we, you know, we teach thousands of students every year. I think we must, maybe we register eight or 9,000 students a year in the department for departmental courses. So it's hard to, it's hard to knock that down if you're a, a STEM fanatic trying to displace money from the humanities to STEM. You just can't do that to make good enrollments. But we could talk more about the yeah, I'm at, I'm at 33. We're on the chopping block. We're at 33,000 students. A department of eight religious studies faculty are on the chopping block. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because we don't, I mean, return on investment. We don't have the numbers. The, the numbers talk, they, really, they talk at state yeah. universities. It really makes a difference. Publicly, I think about 88% of our students are on full scholarship in the university. Because in Florida, if you graduate with an A average, you get free college. Mm -hmm. So they're all, none of them are paying out of their own pockets, really, for it. There's some fees mm -hmm. that they have to pay. Um, so the, the, the argument is different. It's different about, because it's, it's not like state money is allocated uh, com compartmentally, as it is at most state universities. It kind of all goes into these scholarships for students, and they just take whatever they want. So it's a little bit different of a discussion for that reason. Mm -hmm. It was been a really rich conversation. Um, we have to close up. Uh, those of us who are not participating in the meeting here right afterwards, we need to depart briskly. Um, <laughs> go ahead and sign in. If you haven't signed in for the session of credit, please go ahead and get coffee or soda on your way. And please join me in thanking John Corbett.